Good. Um, we have a, the Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator O'Sullivan, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. <laughs> uh, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. I call Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, th I thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I take, well, I'm pleased to be able to present this uh, matter of public importance, but I, but I bring it with, I guess, a, a real sense of um, regret that this is the environment in which we are facing right now. The truth of the matter is that we are facing uh, the worst cost of living crisis that this country has seen in over three decades, and it's been presided over by this, uh, by this government. Cost of living is the single biggest issue that Australians are facing every single day. Yet those on the other side roll around each day looking for others to blame. They blame the Reserve Bank governor, they blame the Ukraine war, the previous government. They continue to go on other than taking responsibility for it themselves. Rather than seeking to fix spiralling inflation, this government pours fuel on the fire. It does nothing about its own fiscal policy while the RBA simultaneously is trying to address monetary policy. The government's actions add to upward inflation pressures. That's what the Reserve Bank have said. This is the reality. During a cost of living crisis, when inflation is rampant, no one is a winner. No one is a winner. High inflation is not selective. It, adds, uh, uh, it affects every aspect of society. Everyone is facing this cost of living crisis. ABS data shows an annual rise in food prices of between 7 and 8 per cent and an annual rise in utilities between 12 and 14 per cent. And that's what Australians are facing. Every time they go down to the grocery store, they're seeing those rising costs and it's affecting them. They're having to make some really, really tough choices. Every time that utility bill arrives in the mail and they open it up, they're seeing significant increases. And this government is all talk but no action. They're not actually addressing the fundamental issues that is addressing this cost of living crisis. The Australian Financial Review today uh, reported that more than one in 10 firms in the retail, hospitality and construction sectors are at risk of going bankrupt in the next 12 months, as high interest rates and consumer slowdown heap pressure on company finances. I mean, that, that is awful because that means jobs. That means jobs in these important industries. People that are working in retail, people that are working in hospitality, they're finding it difficult. These businesses are finding it difficult. Cost of living crisis is biting at the, heel, the heels of the retail industry. We've seen Maya report in their reporting today that their growth has ground to a halt. They saw double-digit growth figures in the first half of the last financial year, double-digit growth figures, and it's, their growth has only increased by 0.4 per cent in the, last, in the last six months. I mean, this is happening across retail. It's happening across hospitality. Anyone that's running a hospitality business will tell you, you go to the, the cafes across, across our cities, across our regional towns, and you'll see that they are struggling. People are having to make tough choices. They're choosing between uh, discretionary funding or paying their mortgage. And that's what's happening. And this is on your watch, Labor. This is on your watch. At 4.1 per cent, interest rates are currently the highest that they've been since 2011. Families are hurting and this government, sadly, is asleep at the wheel. The impact of inflation and rising interest rates is being felt by businesses and families across Australia. Rising uh, mortgage payments, rising prices at the checkout, rising energy bills are all eating away at already, already tight uh, household budgets. This quarter alone, 150,000 people are moving from fixed rates to variable rates. We are facing a cliff here, and this government is not doing enough to address it. They're putting fuel on the fire, and it cannot 
It cannot continue. This government is away at sea when it comes to addressing fundamentals of our economy, particularly in the area of productivity. You don't ever hear the government talk about productivity. You never hear that word come from the Prime Minister's mouth. Yet it's the single most important thing that needs to be addressed to address this cost of living crisis, because you keep putting fuel on the fire by increasing government spending and you're not doing anything to address productivity, which we know will put downward pressure on inflation. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, the claims uh, that this government um, is doing nothing to address the cost of living challenge um, that Australians facing is just <clears throat> absolutely um, outrageous. Um, and so I welcome the opportunity to describe uh, to you some of the measures that the government is putting in place, uh, many of which have been opposed by those opposite, um, to actually help um, Australian families deal with the rise of rising cost of living and deal with the challenges um, that they faced after 10 years of a do-nothing uh, government um, from those opposite. We are a government that is doing exactly what we said we would do. We are not only committed to reducing the cost of living, um, but we have already taken action. We are making medicines cheaper and we are strengthening Medicare. We have cut the price of PBS scripts from the start of this year. Uh, and you know what this could mean for the average family that might have two or three scripts? Um, that's a saving of up to $450 a year. We've tripled the bulk billing incentive, uh, making the largest investment um, in this since Medicare began. The largest investment since Medicare began. Uh, and this is just what is already happening. From the 1st of September, um, those medicines that can be prescribed for 60 days will save people up to $180 a year. We know household bills are rising due to international inflation um, pressures, pressures that we're seeing around the world, and that's why we've taken action uh, and our energy price caps are reducing wholesale electricity prices by up to 50 per cent. Um, and over 5 million households and 1 million small businesses will be receiving targeted electricity bill rebates. We're supporting those families that are struggling with the pressures of cost of living. We've expanded paid parental leave to six months by 2026. We're investing in making early childhood education more affordable. 96 per cent of families will be better off under these changes. We're investing in the skills and training Australians need without the cost, delivering 480,000 fee-free TAFE places. As just one example, a Victorian early childhood education student can now save nearly $9,000 on their training. And importantly, we are getting wages moving again in this country. We supported the largest boost to award wages in a generation, an increase for roughly 2.7 million workers across the country. We funded a 15 per cent wage increase for aged care workers. Wages are growing under labour at their highest level in over 10 years. 10 years. And of course, this is no coincidence. In the last decade, we saw a government that left people behind. Not only did they have no plan to address cost of living, they seemed intent on raising it. The Australian people don't need reminding of what occurred under the former coalition government, um, but it sounds like those opposite do. Let's not forget that this was a government that wanted to charge a $7 GP tax. Uh, this was a government that tried to increase the cost of medicines by $5 and wanted to start charging for emergency department visits as well. Under the coalition, early childhood education costs rose by a staggering 49 per cent. Uh, and in nearly a decade, there was no increase at all to the number of weeks of paid parental leave available to families. Um, and just in case the memories of those opposite are selective, uh, let me quote directly. Uh, the member for Farrah described fee-free TAFE as a waste of taxpayer dollars. Those opposite described low wages as a deliberate design feature of their government's policy. And they, of course, opposed a $1 per hour increase to the minimum wage. They just haven't learnt their lesson. 
Since we've come to government, they've voted against $1.5 billion in energy bill relief. They've opposed allowing millions of Australians to buy two months' worth of medicine for the price of a single prescription before the details were even announced. They've said no to more social and affordable housing, including for women and children fleeing family violence. Uh, so rather than moving motions to politically grandstand, how about those opposite actually support policies that will reduce the cost of living? We're working every day to make Australian lives better, delivering secure jobs, better wages and addressing the cost of living. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, we have to start with some myth-busting again. Uh, pretty much every time we talk about cost of living in this place, we have to start with some myth-busting because those opposite can't help but roll out the myths, truths. Real wages grew under the last coalition government, a slow increase, I will acknowledge, but a sustainable increase, whereas under this Labor government they have plummeted in the face of high inflation. Real wages are declining, and every Australian who receives a pay packet knows it because they know the cost of living is going up faster than their wages. They've seen their mortgage payments absolutely skyrocket in the last 12 months. They've seen the cost of their grocery bills absolutely skyrocket in the last 12 months. And in this period of high inflation, yes, wages have gone up, but it hasn't kept up with the cost of living. Real wages have gone backwards, and that's because we have a Labor government that doesn't have a clue about how to manage the economy. When talking about cost of living pressures, they roll out a few things that they supposedly have done in this space. We hear about pharmaceuticals. Yet the, pharmacy, uh, the pharmacies out there are absolutely horrified by what this Labor government has done in the industry. And now we are seeing patient groups recognise the damage done by this Labor government in the pharmaceutical space and are come out and opposing that policy as well. They trumpet their childcare changes, yet most parents out there know that childcare costs and availability have gotten worse, not better, under this government and they trumpet what they've done in the energy space, whereas in actual fact all they've really done in the energy space is frighten away foreign investment, deter new energy supplies coming into the market, particularly gas coming into the market, and that will over time force up the cost of energy even more. In fact, I ask you, I ask you if you're listening to this out there, Look at your energy bills. Look at your energy bills over the past 14 months under this Labor government. They haven't come down, and you know they haven't come down. Every Australian knows that when the Labor Party stands up in this place and trumpets what it has supposedly done in bringing downward pressure on energy prices, every Australian just has to look at their energy bill to know that that is a mistruth and the Australians will judge that harshly. Senator Bragg. Thanks very much. Well, I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak on this matter of public importance. And it is true that the government has not been able to address the cost of living. In fact, the government has increased the cost of living uh, since their election some 15 months ago. And that is most notable in relation to the cost of a mortgage uh, which for many Australian families is more than $1,000 extra a month they're having to find uh, in what is already a high inflationary environment where the basics are more expensive than they were just a year ago. Uh, and so the question is, though, what is it that the government can do here? Because many people bring their grievances into these chambers it's not always clear to me what exactly people are asking the government itself to do. What, is, what actually is the government in control of? Well, the government is, control, is in control, I should say, rather, of its fiscal policy. So it can set its budget and it can run its affairs in relation to how it engages with the central bank, which runs monetary policy. And on the issue of fiscal policy, 
that is where I think the government have gone wrong. And they have made decisions in, in their two budgets to increase expenditure when the economists and the experts have been calling for spending restraint the government have decided to spend more money. Now that is through the budget causing inflation to increase. But the government has also been fond of establishing off-budget funds, which the, the International Monetary Fund itself has warned are increasing the risk of inflation in Australia. And the real, reality is here is that inflation is running higher in Australia than it is in many comparable countries, including the United States, because the Australian government has decided to run an expansionary fiscal policy. Now, there's some debate about whether that is uh, a neutral policy. Uh, the only reason it could credibly be regarded as a neutral stance is because of the hilarious uh, energy uh, caps, which is effectively the government uh, le legislating away inflation. I mean, if it was that easy, then you would just pass a law that says we're going to have no more inflation. I mean, the idea that uh, that, is the, that is the position, that is the fiscal position of the country is just laughable. Uh, and so that is the one thing that the government can control. Now, the other thing the government can, can, can control is the way it engages with the central bank. Now, the government have decided to engage in a lot of you know, 1990s-style interference with the Reserve Bank. Uh, by ending uh, Philip Lowe's term. Uh, of course, they spent a lot of time campaigning against Philip Lowe, sending their, their backbenchers out to attack Philip Lowe personally for doing his job. And then, of course, the axe fell on Mr Lowe. And there was this public debate about whether the government would uh, appoint a, uh, a Treasury official or maybe someone from the unions, who knows, uh, to go and run the Reserve Bank, which is reminiscent of the 1990s experience. Now, um, we've seen two decades of independence, not interference, in terms of the Reserve Bank. And the government have interfered massively here and have now decided to appoint Michelle Bullock, who I think will be a very fine governor, and I welcome her appointment. Uh, but it's the way you do things that counts. And there was a, a bit of a try on there for a while, a bit of a sense that maybe they were trying to uh, cow or bully the Reserve Bank. Uh, and punish them for doing their job because, of course, the Reserve Bank in raising interest rates is doing the heavy lifting that the government has not been prepared to do. I mean, the government should be running a contractionary fiscal policy. That's what the government should be doing. Now, I know it's hard to cut spending, but ultimately uh, the least you can do is not agree to new spending, which is where we are with this, this government and $42 billion in new expenditure taken in decisions in this uh, this budget period, this budget estimates period. So ultimately, that is the position we're in. That the government have decided to spend more money than they need to. That is fueling inflation. Uh, that is causing the Reserve Bank to increase interest rates. And that is causing mortgage costs to be higher than they should be, and certainly much higher than they have been under the Liberal Party. So at the end of the day, Labor is playing to its true colours. It is making mortgages more expensive and cost of living is much harder. Senator Roberts. Thank you. During the 2022 election campaign, the now Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, promised my Queensland constituents life would be easier under Labor, a metaphorical land of milk and honey. I think the Prime Minister oversold his policies by a football field or two. Milk and honey has turned out to be baked beans on toast, except baked beans are up 50%. So it's more bread and margarine, except margarine is up 40 per cent, and supermarket bread is up from $1.90 a loaf to $2.70 a loaf. That loaf of bread is made from 98 per cent Australian ingredients purchased from Australian farmers on a long-term supply agreement. The government cannot blame the war in Ukraine for price rises on a product made here. I do, however, know where to place that blame. The, Australian, the Australia Institute has correctly pointed out that our supermarket oligopoly is exploiting their market share to rip off consumers for record profits. The government has not acted on supermarket or petrol profiteering, despite having the power to do so. And the ACCC is asleep at the wheel. Manufacturers' costs have increased, especially thanks to the net zero, the UN 2050 net zero madness 
that started under the previous Liberal government and pursued now enthusiastically by the Champagne Socialists on the left in the Labor Party. Closing cheap baseload coal power and replacing it with unreliable wind and expensive wind and solar has forced up electricity prices along the entire supply chain. Farmers' cool rooms and packing sheds are costing more to light and to refrigerate. Warehouses are more expensive. Supermarket fridges are more expensive. One Nation knows, because we listen around the country, every problem in this country is due to excessive government, especially central government. And we know the solutions are with the people. Just set the people free from this UN rubbish and we'll get everything right. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, we're all very aware that the worldwide challenges and the economy across the world, and of course, those challenges right here at home. And of course, when we start talking about those challenges, we've got to listen to what the, those on the opposite side say about what it actually means for the fight, the fight ahead against some of those challenges, how we actually tackle them. But also, you've got to put it in perspective, because there was a perspective given by Peter Dutton last year about some of those same challenges, where he was a lot more honest than he is now, because he spoke about the hard economic challenges in the times ahead. And I'll quote Peter Dutton, over the next couple of years, where we are going to have headwinds economically, as you know, he said on sunrise 8 February 2022, he went on to say, we have to be again realistic about what's happening economically over the coming years, and that was on the Today Show, 5 April 2022, and went on to say, I think if you look at what's happening in the United States at the moment, where inflation is at 7 per cent, a similar story in parts of Europe, I think we need to really be realistic about the economic risks on the horizon. That's the Sky News on the 24th of April 2022. So you know, the political opportunism is one thing, but then you start saying, well, what have they supported to make a difference on cost of living? Now, of course, we know the difference they've made. They've made none, because every time a proposition has been put forward about dealing with the cost of living pressures on hard-working Australians and those doing it tough, they've voted it down. Now, of course, we know that their strategy was always to have low wages, was a deliberate design feature of those opposite. We know that the Liberal and National Party are for low wages. But who would have thought they'd oppose a dollar per hour increase the minimum wage? And don't worry, they said that before the election and they kept that tune after the election. Now, of course, when we start putting policies forward to give people the opportunity to deal with the, wage pressure, the cost of living pressures and to look at realistic and fair wage increases, they said no. And what did Dutton say? because it's going to lower, it's going to increase wages. He said specifically it's going to result in high wages if we support the jobs, the secure jobs and better pay uh, bill. Now, again and again, they're always opposed. They said no to banning pay secrecy clauses and, of course, the efforts to close the gender pay gap. Because, again, for all those on wages, those ones on salaries, they don't want people to get better wages to deal with those challenges. And then start looking at some of the more detailed government policies that were put forward. Tripling bulk billing incentives from, our, from this government, from the Albanese government. The largest investment in bulk billing incentives ever, ever, to take some pressure off cost of living. Reducing the cost of medicines by up to half for at least six million people. And of course, you only have to look at those opposite and they're the same sort of people that wanted to charge $7 GP tax. They tried to increase the cost of medicines by $5. They wanted to, change, they wanted to charge for emergency department visits. Well, they wanted to charge for emergency <laughs> department visits. And of course, they're opposed to allowing millions of Australians to buy two months' worth of medicine for the price of a single prescription before details were even announced and refusing to back patients. That's what the previous government did, and that's what they're doing in opposition. They're undermining the opportunity for people to be able to get by, to deal with the cost of living challenges. And of course, when you start dealing with cost of living, one of the smart things you do, you also look at investments so we can get productivity up. 
So a smart area to do that, because of the dismal failure we've had for over a decade in productivity, building capacity within our economy, what do we do? We turn around and come up with a great policy, a policy we took the election, supported by the community, to have free TAFE. 480,000 fee-free TAFE places. Not only is it a cost of living exercise, but also it's an exercise to make sure we get productivity. We invest in Australians. And of course, what do they do? Susan Lay, the Deputy Opposition Leader, leader says fee-free TAFE will, is a waste of taxpayers' money. They're against skills. They're against the minimum wage being increased. Don't get me to housing, because they're against $10 billion being spent on some of the most disadvantaged people in our community. They're against on energy uh, controls. These people have no sense about what's in the interest thank, of Australia. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, Senator Rennick. Thank you, Adam, uh, acting, uh, uh, pre Ms. acting President. Um, uh, uh, can I say, Deputy President? Uh, yeah. Can I say I, I, I too support this uh, motion put forward by Senator O'Sullivan. And the last 15 months uh, under the Albanese government uh, is reminiscent of the movie Apocalypse Now, uh, where we've got uh, Albanese Prime Minister Albanese, uh, a bit like Marlon Brando, Colonel, Colonel Walter Kurtz, at the end, you know, with painting his face uh, with the voice and being distracted while his Colonel. Uh, is either Colonel Colonel Gilcor, Gilcor, Kilgore, uh, Jim Chalmers is out there saying he loves the, loves the smell of poverty in the morning. He loves the smell of homelessness because that's what we've had under the Albanese government. 15 months of sheer horror. Sorry, um, sh I, I, sorry, Senator Rennick. I think I have Senator McAllister on a feed. Thank you. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I, I think um, senators understand that. Firstly, we ought to refer to people in the other place by the correct titles, and secondly, uh, we ought not reflect, particularly reflect inaccurately in specific ways on the motivations and attitudes of other senators. And I do think Senator Rennick has transgressed both of those requirements. I'll remind Senator Rennick of of the of your request, Senator Rennick. You have the call. So, sorry, Senator McAllister, I'm not quite sure what I was saying. I was just throwing a bit of colour into the MPI this afternoon, a bit of alliteration and metaphorical. I know you guys like to keep it all driven drab, but uh, you know we'll uh, push push back on the fact, on the fact, and you don't like it. I know you don't like it, but the fact of the matter is Australians are doing it tough, and they're doing it tough because the Albanese government has no idea, no idea of what they are doing. They are running a high immigration high immigration rate at the time that we have got a rental crisis. And at the same time, they're cutting back on infrastructure. Now, why would you cut back on infrastructure spending if you're having more people coming to the country? You would think you would need more dams. You would think you would need more reliable baseload energy. No, 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 no. But what the Albanese government is doing is that they're wasting money on renewable projects. They're wasting money on the voice. That is a complete and utter distraction from the real issues in this country, which is cost of living. Cost of living. And we've had a Prime Minister that's been out of the country, probably more, more than any other Prime Minister in history, running around, gallivanting around the world, big noting himself with the uh, globalists, instead of dealing with the hardship here brought about by a government that is effectively, through high immigration, high interest rates, they haven't actually expanded the volume of money in the system, which is what the 1937 Banking Royal Commission said that we should do to control supply. No, 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 no. They're not dealing with any supply side issues whatsoever. All they are doing, well, actually, I'll take that back. They are. They're restricting supply by cutting back on infrastructure. And I know that those on the other side mightn't like to hear that, but the fact of the matter is they don't have any answers. And what they want to do rather than actually deal and provide solutions to the problems that they've created, is distract us. But distract us with things like you know, the voice, which is going to be a complete and utter waste of time. We don't even know what the date of the voice is, because I wish you guys would get on with it, because the sooner we can get rid of the voice and get that over and done with, we can move on to real issues, which is cost of living. Cost of living. Now, Prime Minister Albanese still hasn't been able to explain to the Australian people why, before the election, he said he would cut energy prices by $275.
Has he done that? No, he has not done that. Energy prices have gone up by $700 by June 30 of this year, and then the energy companies have come out and said they're going to increase power prices by another 30 per cent. By another 30 per cent. And why is that? I'll tell you why that is, because that is the obsession, that is because of the obsession of the Labor Party and their friends in the Greens who are obsessed with unreliable and unrecyclable energy, otherwise known as renewables, but that's actually a misnomer. And as we've just seen recently, we've got these wind turbines you know, stuck in the forests of North Queensland. They want to build more of these wind turbines. They're going to destroy our environment. They're going to destroy the, you know, people's uh, um, disposable income. And then we've got, we've got this whole issue of whereby we can't get people in the houses. We cannot build enough houses in this country. And what's Labor's uh, solution to this? They are going to continue to increase superannuation and lift that superannuation levy to 12 per cent by 2025. Now, I'm calling on the Labor Party to actually cut superannuation. Cut it back to 6 per cent, or if you, can, if you like, you can split it in half now. 5 per cent optional, 5 per cent uh, um, uh, compulsory. Will you do that? And that way that will let people keep a little bit more of their hard-earned wages because we know Labor loves to steal wages. Superannuation is wage theft. Uh, it takes money from the battlers and gives it to the elites in their ivory towers in Sydney and Melbourne. And that's not on. That's not on. So, Senator McAllister, if you want to sort of get all picky and choosy about my you know, reflections, I suggest forget that. It was merely a deflection. You need to get on and focus with cost Thank of living. Senator Rennick, um, your time has expired uh, and the time for this discussion has expired.